All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charles Nyabeze, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar uh, where we are going to be hearing a technology disclosure by Anthea, and she'll be speaking to us about a real-time metal monitoring in solution technology. Um, but before we get, go get going, uh, just some house rules here. Uh, what we will ask of you is that uh, if you have any questions, please type those questions in the chat box. This webinar will be for 20 minutes for the presentation, followed by 10 minutes for answers and questions and answers. And what we'll do is after the webinar, we're going to send a link uh, to the recording and also provide you a copy of the presentation slides uh, in your inbox so that you can uh, have a chance to share them with your, with your peers. Okay. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Anthea to present. Thank you, Anthea. Great, thanks so much for the introduction, Charles. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for coming out today. It's exciting to have the opportunity to tell you about our new sensor. Um, so 2S Water have developed a solution for real-time metal monitoring in solution. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the current state of testing. Uh, then I'll tell you about our solution, some applications and how we would love you to get involved. So just a little bit about 2S Water to start. Uh, we are a startup out of Edmonton, Alberta. We're a group of inspired scientists and nerds who, who wanted to address what we knew was a pertinent problem with detecting metals in water in real time. And we've had some great support. I, I'd like to thank Sammy for having us out today and being such a strong supporter and Charles for all his work he's done there. And, uh, and we are a University of Alberta partner. Uh, so thank you to them as well for all the support they've put behind this project to date. The problem with data is that it is driving stale. Uh, in order to know what metals are in your water, right now we're relying on intermittent testing. Either you're mailing it to a lab or you're taking a sample to an in-house laboratory. The core problem with both of those lies in sample taking. Um, it costs labor hours to send to get those samples. You have to access remote sites, which can mean driving out to, to locations, even sometimes helicoptering to locations in order to get samples. Just not a practical way of doing things. COVID restrictions have only exacerbated this. It's decreased the number of people we can have on the floor, and it's increased the amount of, of tasks that they have on hand, making sample taking even more of an, of an issue. And of course, it's error prone. When you have a human taking a sample, there's all kinds of places where this can go wrong. You know, you can get cross contamination, you can have dirty containers, you can have mislabeling, all kinds of ways in which your data can actually be inaccurate even before you've engaged in the testing process. From there, you have two alternatives. You're either mailing it to a lab or you're taking it to your in-house laboratory. If you're mailing it, in North America, you're lucky if you're getting it in 72 hours. Realistically, it's probably gonna be about 10 days before you get your results. And just don't be in South America because it's taking two months usually to get your test data. Uh, that's just far too long for any kind of purposes that, that you wanna apply this data for. When you do get that data, it arrives in an email. So then you have to integrate it into your systems. Your alternative, of course, is to build an in-house laboratory. That can cost in the millions to set up and in the hundreds of thousands every year to run a full wet lab. And even with that, you're still getting your data by email. It's not integrated with systems. And about what we're hearing on average is that the results arrive in between every four to eight hours. Uh, for many processes, this is still far too delayed for any kind of practicality. The result is damaged machinery from scaling and, and improperly cleaned water site shutdowns for non-compliance and environmental effluent dumping, uh, expensive fines when that those effluents are identified, lost revenue when metals escape through process that could be charged for and properly extracted, and of course the high cost of testing which is far beyond the actual cost when you include all of the, the labor hours, the sample taking, all that kind of thing. It's an inefficient process that isn't working to date. Our solution is an online sensor which connects directly to the pipe and monitors for 31 different metals, including heavy metals. We have another 47 we may be able to detect, but 31 is what we validated in laboratory to date. Uh, we generate real-time data in between every minute and every five minutes, depending on the application. And we're placed directly in situ so that we are 
taking the sample where it needs to be taken and generating the data on site. Uh, this is a, a representation of our aquavolid sensor, which is in the field currently. Uh, so this is what it looks like. We, we install next to a pipe wherever you're already taking the sample. We just put in a T-junction there so that we can take a slipstream off of the pipe. From there, our sensor does all the auto automated sample preparation and generates the data. We do output a little bit to wastewater, but other than that, we're, we're pretty much a closed loop system. Uh, then the data is sent however you would like to receive it. Uh, right now we have a user interface set up so that you can see the data and, and interact with it. And when you're ready, we integrate with your SCADA system so that the operator actually has it where they need to make those intelligent decisions about their processes. Um, we have parts per billion resolution in most contaminants. Uh, it is determined on, on a contaminant by contaminant basis. So if you have specific ones you wanna know about, that's a conversation we're quite happy to have. Uh, fully automated, so no, it's plug and play and no skilled user required. And we're remote IoT, so you don't even need a user on site. We can be installed somewhere and send the data directly to your, your head office or wherever you need to receive it. Uh, these are our analytes currently. So as I said, 31 are validated and 47 are in process. We have uh, every reason to believe we should be able to see them. We just haven't had a chance to test them yet. Um, some interesting uh, metals in here for um, in-process optimization. We have copper, zinc, uh, lithium, uh, mercury, gold for effluent monitoring, uh, selenium, lead, iron, manganese uh, for municipal applications. Uh, we also have all the, the ones of, of current risk, so all those heavy metals that are of concern. Um, so yeah, a couple applications. Uh, the, the three applications that we generally look at in the mining industry are process optimization, machinery maintenance, and tailings monitoring. Um, in process optimization, we can either work with brine mining, where the, the metal is actually fully submersed in the aqueous fluid, or we can look at optimized extraction from mixed streams. So in, uh, in brine mining, most of the work we've done is in lithium, where we're very excited about the potential to enable some of these new battery metal technologies that are up and coming. Um, we've also talked a fair bit about uh, mercury and gold and effluent streams where, you know, that revenue is passing through the system and can be properly extracted uh, to generate more revenue. Uh, An unconventional process water is another place where we're looking at pretty extensively uh, to apply mining processes post uh, oil and gas extraction in order to gather all the metals from what is actually a, a pretty lucrative brine that we find in those waters. Uh, there's also extraction optimization in mixed metal streams where we can help detect how much of each metal is in a stream so that they can be properly separated into two high grade products versus one kind of B grade product. We can help facilities get their quality up to those battery levels so that we can actually charge a higher market price for the product that is generated from your facility. Um, in machinery maintenance, we're looking at, at uh, boiler water maintenance closed loop maintenance and corrosion detection. Uh, so for boiler maintenance, uh, monitoring the calcium and magnesium usually just post the lime softening process so that we can determine that the, the actual implementation is correct. Uh, this is really a, a great savings because we can reduce labor in testing. Uh, usually when applying real-time data, we see about a 30% reduction in chemical usage. And then of course, the, the long-term effects of not having that scaling on a boiler. One of the boilers that we did analysis on a 2% scaling factor was $10,000 a day in increased fuel costs. So it, it's small and cumulative, and it, it makes an absolutely massive difference to the bottom line. Um, corrosion is another one we're very excited about. The detection of corrosion in hard to reach areas is extremely problematic right now. Uh, corrosion causes metal to escape into the fluids, and there we can detect them so that we can properly monitor for the change as it occurs and detect that corrosion without invasive methodologies. Um, of course, tailings monitoring is another uh, place where we can step in. So, so monitoring for environmental compliance, making sure that as the, the constituents of that water change, the treatment process is still effectively withdrawing everything that needs to be withdrawn. So that we can detect when we have an, an exceedance of the parameters and stop that water from going into the environment to either send it through, through reprocessing or to send it to a, uh, a tailings pond or downhole um, dumping site. And of course, recirculated water. Um, you know, it's vital to process these days to keep water use as low as possible. 
Um, so by helping make sure that water is properly cleaned before it goes back into facility, we can increase the amount of reprocessed water that is available for usage within the facility and overall reduce the amount of water the facility is using. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Uh, we are right now reaching out to, uh, to industry for more pilot sites. We do have a unit currently piloting in the field. Uh, we want some more pilots. We want some demonstration of, of, of the value that we bring. We're also interested in, in participating in a study with a company who has an, a particular issue of concern. Um, some of the issues that we've identified where we could potentially bring some really interesting data would be uh, corrosion, water flow management, and uh, of course, the specific, specific qualities of tailings. Um, so if any of this sounds like it's of interest to you, uh, we would really like to connect with you. So um, do we have any questions? I see we have a bunch actually. All right. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much, Anthea, for that for that presentation. Um, you know, just prior to Anthea starting a presentation, we did have a question from an audience member here, and I'm going to just read that first question out. And that first question was from Parsi, and it's, uh, do you have a product service that you're currently shipping paying customers? So we have our first pilot in the field generating data, and we are looking at sending out our first uh, paid units in the early new year here. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that answer, Anthea. Uh, the next question here is, um, can you differentiate between free and bound complexes? So unfortunately, we tend to blow apart the chemical bonds as we analyze them. So generally not. We can detect total levels, but not whether they were free or bound before we detected them. Okay. All right. Thank you for that answer. This question is from Charles. Um, another Charles. Okay. And the question is, uh, is the detection method through ion selective membranes? Um, so we do not use an ion selective membrane within our sensor, if that's the question. I'm not sure I've interpreted it correctly. Okay. Uh, Charles, just let us know if that answer was uh, sufficient for you. And if not, just to re-ask the question. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I was just asking um, uh, because I wanted some clarity about if it's only one specific species that you're capturing or different ions, or is it a range? That's why it was relevant. Oh, yes. So so we, we capture mm -hmm. a range. We're actually a spectroscopic based analysis. Um, so what makes us particularly cool. unique is how yeah. we generate the light for analysis. Okay, thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. Um, next question here is from uh, Joran, and the question is, how do you deal with sensor fouling? Yeah, so sensor fouling uh, is something that we're adapting a solution to now. Um, right now, we do have an, an in-sensor cleaning solution, uh, but in general, we deal well with uh, so dissolved solids, not suspended solids. So we are adapting a solution right now uh, to remove suspended solids in the instances where we expect to see fouling from them. As long as the solids are fully dissolved, uh, we've been dealing with high concentrations without a great deal of fouling due to uh, uh, the internal cleaning mechanism that we have to date. Awesome. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question is from Frank. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the main limitations of the solution? Uh, well, so I think that the one I've just outlined is a major limitation in the fact that we cannot deal with uh, d uh, suspended solids. Um, we really need them to be dissolved. Um, and, and they can be problematic for us if we have too many suspended solids at this point. We are working on adapting a solution to that. We're right in the base of, of oil sands here, and we know we have to deal with a lot of water that has those constituents in it. So it, it's vital to us to find a solution. Um, our other limitations right now is that we are a, designed as an indoor unit. Um, we know there's applications in outdoor, and we also know there's mobile applications. We have not yet adapted this technology to those situations, but we will be as we go forward. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, next question is from uh, Lionel. The question is, uh, what are the water temperature ranges that this works in? Yeah, so right now we can deal with 50 degrees Celsius down to about one degree Celsius. Um, we are adapting a, a cooling system for waters which come in at a higher temperature. We're expecting to deal with waters up into the, the high hundred centigrade, so. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, next question is from Amelie. And the question is, how do, you how, how do the detection limits compare to ICP analysis? Yeah, and we are very similar to ICP analysis. Um, as, as you saw that we expect to be able to see everything ICP can see. 
in general, we're seeing about the same. For some contaminants, we're seeing lower detection limits, and for some, we're seeing slightly higher. So in general, we're in the range of ICP. Gotcha. All right. Okay, next question came to me as a direct message. And the question is, do you have any limitations on whose sensors you can integrate into your system? Um, so we are a full standalone system. We don't necessarily uh, integrate, sorry, we haven't yet integrated with other sensors directly. Um, if you have a project that would involve that, I'd be really interested in discussing that. Uh, it's just something that we haven't explored to date yet. Um, we do generate our data and are integrating with SCADA systems. So um, data-wise, we can, we can do the integration. That's non-problematic. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, the next question is uh, from Adam. It's, uh, is, there any, is there any opportunity to use this on ground water wells or does it need a constant flow? Uh, so I think there is an opportunity to use that and it would just be a software adaptation to make sure that we ran testing based on this, the sequence that you would be expecting a, a flow from. So uh, no, we don't need a constant flow. Yes, we could do groundwater wells. <laughs> okay. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, next question is from Mike. Um, what is the minimum detection limits and what is the accuracy? Uh, and I guess the qualification is confi confirmed by lab testing, presumably. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, really, I have a table of those. So, um, Mike, I will reach out to you afterwards. It really depends on a contaminant by contaminant basis where our MDLs are to date. Um, yes, and, and we are confirming those against laboratory testing. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, Sorry, next. Just oh. to add that we are mostly in the parts per billion. Parts per billion. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, next question is from, uh, I think it's here, Jeron or Yaron. Uh, the question is uh, how do you validate the inline data? So right now we are validating against ICP testing in the laboratory. That's how we're doing our initial validation. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Another question from Al. The question is, uh, how often do you need to calibrate the sensor? Uh, so we actually have an internal calibration cycle. Uh, we are expecting to have to do an external calibration annually. Uh, but we have an internal calibration that we want to run um, on a regular basis to keep the, the system in line. Um, okay. Now. Having said that, we haven't deployed a unit for a year yet, so um, that's that's the design goal. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So I acknowledge uh, a comment from Charles, uh, and the comment is uh, very cool technology. So, okay, so moving on with the questions. Uh, what are the daily maintenance requirements? And this is a question from Dave. Thank you, Dave. Um, so we don't have any daily maintenance requirements. Uh, we do have one input, which we will occasionally need refilling. Uh, but we're probably looking at quarterly uh, maintenance on on the uh, facility side. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a question here from Malala, and uh, I think your question is: um, Do you know the contamination particle sizes, and uh, what kind of water flow process are you using? Um, so I don't know the particle sizes. We generally just detect. Um, single atomics. So um, the, the particle size would be dependent on the, the specific atomic. I'm not sure I'm answering the right question on that. And um, right now we are adapting. We haven't found a limitation on which processes we can work with to date. So I'd be happy to discuss a specific use case uh, with you, Lala, at some point, if that makes more sense. Thank you for that. Okay, another question is through direct message and the message, the, the, the question is, do you make your own sensors or do you use someone else's? Yeah, we make our own. So um, a lot of the core parts of our sensor are off the shelf units, but what makes us truly unique is how we generate the light that we analyze. So we are spectroscopic analysis. We buy our spectroscope, but the light we generate in a very, very unique way much unlike anyone else is doing. So that's that's where our core innovation lies. Awesome. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm not seeing any Can other questions. Else? I did have one question come to me on the private chat. Okay, go ahead. Find the flow me. requirements for the slipstream. How large of a flow can it draw from? Uh, so we draw a quite small flow from the stream. Um, we draw in the around five milliliters per minute, quite a small amount. Um, 
generally we can deal with a large flow as long as it's turbulent enough that we're expecting the constituents to be relatively similar. If we're expecting a fair amount of variation, then we'll deal with that by con uh, conglomerating the results of multiple tests. So in, in an instance where we're expecting a fair bit of variation, then we might have to use, you know, uh, 15 minutes of testing, you know, every minute to get a MDL that we're comfortable with. Um, so that's how we're attempting to deal with that now. It's something that we'd really like to do more testing on in the field to see how that results. Uh, one of the things that's hard to generate in our lab is, is large flows to, to, to test against, so. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I have another question here uh, from uh, Karine. And the question is, uh, what is the maximum turbidity the sensor can work with? Uh, yeah, we prefer low turbidity waters at this point. Um, so I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I will talk to my physicist and get the, the number that we are currently capable of dealing with in turbidity. All right. So, and having said that, you know, high dissolved solids, we can deal up to the, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands in dissolved solids. Uh, it's suspended solids where we have problems. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, Another question I have here is, um, you mentioned regular calibration, but what kind of sensor drift do you get? Uh, and the second part of the question is, is there a trigger for internal calibration that activates when drift is larger than a specific threshold? Yes, so that's that's how we're handling internal calibration uh, to date. And part of why I have to say one to five minutes, because we don't know how often we're gonna need to run that, that calibration cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have internal drift detection methodology, yes. Hey, well, Anthea, while I'm waiting for other questions to show up here, I did have a question that I wanted to, to ask you. And the question I had was, um, in, so for somebody who has maybe a, 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 a water body that they need to, to monitor, um, how big a sample size do they need to send to you in order for you to validate whether or not this is something you could work with? Yeah, and that's great. We absolutely love when people send us samples. We're happy to do uh, validation testing. We need about half a liter not very much yeah that that allows us to do a lot of testing so as i said we use a, just a few milliliters per test run so uh small yeah. samples are, are absolutely appreciated yeah another question from charles here i uh, think you, charles uh the question is are there testing standards built in to the unit um so sorry what do you mean by testing standards in this instance sorry charles i always make you clarify no, uh, <laughs> I, i'm thinking about for calibration like uh, are those end up uh, um, testing? I, you, you said you're testing for drift, uh, but are there some, some standards that are built in that you are like, calibrating with uh, um, in the unit itself or, or is that a, external? Yeah, so right now we do have an internal calibration um, source so that you know we'll have a little bit of a known value. Uh, we're hoping in the future to be able to calibrate off something that exists in water in general, but right now we do have an internal calibration standard, yes. Thank you for that. Okay, another question here from Jeron. The question is, uh, how does the sensor work under high metrics effects? Yeah. Uh, the example is perspiration, calcium, and manganese in the presence of uh, sodium chloride. <laughs> yeah, so actually, um, so far we've been doing very well. That's the kind of question I can never fully generalize on. Um, we're always happy to take a sample and, and run analysis for you. Uh, but a lot of the work we did in the early days was on lithium brines. And lithium brines are pretty much everything in the periodic table, plus all the salts you can you can shake in there. Um, and we've done very well on those to date. So um, happy to test a sample for you. So far, we've been doing well. I hate to generalize out that to everything, um, but but very excited to see what, what your water might hold. Thank you for that answer. Uh, another question here for, uh, through private message. It's uh, what environmental conditions, uh, temperature, humidity, does your monitoring system require? And the and the, uh, the other question is, what are the hottest and coldest that you can operate in? Yeah, so it currently we're, we need to be in an indoor environment. Uh, we are working to make a unit for an outdoor environment. We know that there's a high market demand for that. Uh, but it will probably be mid to late next year before we have a unit that can be in an outdoor environment. And then for that, we are designing something that can go from like minus 40 to plus whatever we expect to see in the environment. You know, I had some guys tell me they were expecting 150 Celsius um, on the roof where they were installing the unit. So we are working to those extreme use cases when we get that, that ready. 
Awesome. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in. Uh, what are the water pH ranges that the sensor can analyze? Um, so we're we're comfortable with pretty much any pH range. We really like low pH water, um, and we can work with high pH water as well. Okay, very good. Uh, and can the unit operate on solar power? That's a question from Al. Um, I don't see why not. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but uh, I, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to. We are a pretty low power draw, despite the fact that we're creating a plasma. Uh, you know, we, we plug into a regular wall socket, so there's no reason we wouldn't be able to operate on solar. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, another question here is, uh, do you have an approximate price point for every unit, for your unit presently? So it really depends a lot on the, the specific application, how many metals you're looking at and what we expect in the constituent water. Um, I'd be very happy to, to hop on a call, explore a few of those factors and see what kind of price we think would be appropriate for your use case, so. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, another question we have here is, uh, do, you comply, do you comply with CE? Um, sorry, what's CE in this instance? I think it'll be maybe a standard uh, of some sort. Uh, Your Honor, you want to just maybe clarify what you mean by CE? Okay, maybe we can come back to that question in a moment. But I do have another question. I run into a lot, so sorry. <laughs> Acronyms, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that question in a moment. Um, oh, the other question is uh, for price. If if you assume pH seven and they want metals, what is the ballpark estimate? That's another pricing question. Okay. Yeah, and, and it really depends on um, what we're expecting to see in the water and what the environmental conditions are. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I would be happy to follow up with you in, in a separate conversation. Sure, thank you for that. Uh, another question here is, um, uh, can you set alarms uh, on your system? Yes, yeah, yeah, we can set alarms uh, when a constituent reaches a certain threshold. Uh, if you'd like to be informed and we have staggered alarms so you can set what happens when that alarm happens you can get an email you know you can um, trigger an automated phone call or we can you know send you a note saying you need to stop your facility right now depending on okay perfect there you go. So, okay um, Joran, i'm sorry i'm sure i'm pronouncing your name wrong um we are generally uh working to canadian standards but we have found that those match the european standards pretty closely so um i will double check with my team on that and see what the discrepancies are between those standards okay and i have a question here about sharing the information post webinar yes we will be sharing the recording of this webinar and we'll be sharing the, the slides as well uh, another question i have here is um can you comment on operating costs for the unit yeah, so the operating costs are quite low. As I said, we just plug into a regular power source. We do consume power. Uh, we do require an internet or cell connection of some sort. Um, as our first deployment is indoor, usually that's already existent in most facilities we're in, and that will not be the case as we get to outdoor, but we'll deal with that when we get there. Uh, and we do require a bit of fresh water in order to clean out the sample and run cleaning cycles. Um, so that's basically the cost of operation. Okay, okay, got you. Another question I have here is, um, is this unit, um, can you use this technology for municipal water? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we, we are fully applicable for municipal applications. In general, our goal has been that each of our MDLs hits the uh, federal water guidance. We're not always quite right there, but that's our, that's our design. Okay, all right. Okay, um, Anthea, I'm not seeing any new questions, but we do have two minutes to go. So um, I'm gonna ask uh, that uh, for maybe over the, the next two, two minute, or minute or so, if you can just maybe wrap it up and kind of give us a, a, a conclusion of, uh, of the presentation. Sure, yeah. So uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, you know, as we said, we can detect metals in water in real time. We're looking for pilots. We're looking for uh, people who are interested in doing studies. And, you know, I'm always interested in discovering more and understanding the, the environment that you're out there. So if anyone on this call is, is interested in stepping on a phone call or willing to, to have a conversation with me, I'm always very excited to do that. And, you know, we'll be reaching out to everyone after this webinar. So thank you very much for coming today. Awesome. All right, uh, Anthea, again, you know, there's always a, a sneaking in last question here. Uh, the question, the last, last, last question is, do you have, or are you working towards any ISO certification such as uh, 17025? Yeah, we are working towards ISO certification. Yeah. 
Uh, we're right. still running through design iterations. We have a little ways to go on that, but that is our absolutely our goal. Okay, awesome. Well, on behalf of uh, the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Anthea, and Cheers Water for this uh, presentation. And uh, we're looking forward to um, seeing uh, your technology being adopted by the mining industry. Thank you, Anthea. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me, Charles. I appreciate it. And thank you to our guests for attending this webinar. We appreciate you very much.